without lettuce. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know how much the original artwork for Metallica's Master of Puppets is worth? Why did someone throw a sandwich at guitarist Kirk Hammett? Who was the one-armed man that drummer Lars Ulrich called to borrow something he probably wouldn't be using anymore? Stick around as we answer these questions and more on 10 Fun Facts About Master of Puppets by Metallica. Number 1. The Freaks Come Out at Night If it's true that the Freaks come out at night, then I consider Metallica to be quite freaky. Now it's not at all uncommon for musical performers to be nocturnal creatures. After all, they stay up late doing their job entertaining us during our non-working hours. Quite often, they have to spend their own late night hours packing things up and getting back on the road headed to their next tour destination. It is also not uncommon for a band to spend their late night hours drinking and enjoying their time off. Especially a band like Metallica. A band so well known for their excessive drinking that venues often knew to stock their bars in advance of Metallica's performances as a band would typically drink themselves into a festive mood before going on stage. So why not carry those same hours and routines while working in the studio? Well that's exactly what Metallica did opting to record Master of Puppets at Sweet Silence Studios in Copenhagen, Denmark, where the band began work each day at 7 p.m. Now, those who live in or have been to Denmark know just how dark things can get in the fall months. With members of the band waking up in the afternoon to begin what is essentially a graveyard shift. I mean, hey, a graveyard shift of recording music is still a graveyard shift, right? Even if it doesn't crush a person's soul in the way of working in an office does, the members of Metallica must have grown quite pale as their exposure to the sun was minimal. Hmm, with all this darkness, perhaps Master of Puppets should have been called the Black Album. Fool this man! No, I take that back. It's just fine as it is. Drummer Lars Ulrich told Revolver what the process was like. We worked at night, so for three months, I don't think we saw daylight. This was like September, October, November, December. So in Denmark, if you wake up at four in the afternoon, it's already dark. So we'd wake up, and then we'd go down in the studio and start at seven. And then we'd work until five or six in the morning, then go back to the hotel and do the breakfast buffet. And then we would go to bed. So we never saw any daylight for the whole time. And my main recollection is just how dark it was. But the main thing about Master of Puppets, compared to Ride the Lightning, is that we had more time to make it. We were originally going to record in Los Angeles, but our management had figured out that, with the way the currency was, we could get 12 or 14 weeks of studio time in Denmark, instead of 8 weeks in LA. And that was important because, at that time, the big thing that was driving the records was Sonics. You needed more time to get the big drum sounds. It was the time of Pyromania and Back in Black and it was all about how big the kick drum sounded. So it was important to have more time in the studio. And that's why we were in Denmark. Number two, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Have you ever heard your father or grandfather say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Well, Metallica adopted this philosophy when recording Master of Puppets, opting to return to the same studio in Denmark to work with producer Fleming Rasmussen, the same producer who recorded their previous album, Ride the Lightning. As drummer Lars Ulrich explains, We were fiercely anti-producer. We didn't want a producer coming in and messing with our song, or telling James to sing harmony vocals or anything like that. Fleming was there to help with the sonics. The songs pretty much remained the way we wrote them. If you listen to the demos, we didn't rearrange them or anything like that. It was just about the sonic. Nowadays, when we make records, it's about trying to make it sound as lively as possible and as full of spunk and vibe. Back then, it was all about getting it tight. So much time was spent trying to make everything super tight to the point of being completely anal. When I hear the record now, it sounds a little too tight. 
and it sounds like the master tapes got left in a reverb tank for too long. But that's the way it sounded at that time, and I wouldn't change anything. Fleming was happy to work with the band again, as he quite enjoyed their previous collaboration. He also got to witness the band's growth between the two albums, watching Metallica go from a band of couch crashers to a band who could now afford their own hotel room. As he told Metal Hammer, they had matured quite a bit, and their circumstances were improved. This time, they had hotel rooms, rather than sleeping on a friend's floor, but they were just as likable. Every day they would have dinner with my wife and myself at our house before we started recording at 7 p.m., and they were always fun to have around. There was so much more they could do now because their craftsmanship had improved. Everything was a notch up. We had more time to finesse subtle things, little details you can hear with headphones. Master of Puppets is superb, maybe their masterpiece. I've turned down so many bands over the years who thought they'd automatically get their own master just by working with me. Not every band can be Metallica. Metallica enjoyed working with Fleming so much that they tried to get him to work on a third album with them when they were looking to record and Justice For All. However, this time they were rejected. When asked if it was true that he turned down Metallica, Fleming explained, Yes, but it was a timing thing. Lars called me in November 87 and said, We've booked a studio from January 1st. We're doing a new album and we want you to produce it. I said, Lars, I can't. I'm busy until April. And he was like, No, you have to come. We've booked the studio. Move everything else. I said, I can't, Lars. No. So they started with Mike Klink instead and then begged me to come over when it was obvious that wasn't working. What do you say? Come on! Nah. Come on! Nah. Oh, come on! Number three. You won't be needing this. Meet Rick Allen, drummer for Def Leppard. Some would argue that he is one of the greatest rock and roll drummers of all time. A strong argument, considering the man only has one arm. His right arm. Metallica drummer Lars Ulrich was seeking a specific snare drum sound for the recording of Master of Puppets, the kind of sound that comes only from a Ludwig Black Beauty snare drum. The only person he knew of that owned one was Rick Allen, who at the time was still recovering from the car accident which took his left arm. Suddenly, a light bulb popped up over Lars's head. Album producer Fleming Rasmussen told Rolling Stone about the phone call Lars made to Rick's manager. So Lars called their manager and said, Hey, Rick's not using the snare right now. Can you send it over? The next day it was there. They just overnighted it. Then on one of his days off, he went to some music shops in Denmark and found one that had been sitting on a shelf for like 10 years and it cost the 1976 price. Now he's got like 20 of them. Hey man, since you won't be using that blue lightsaber anymore, uh, do you think I could borrow it? No! No! Number 4. Inspiration Metallica's Master of Puppets is often described as a masterpiece. The band may or may not agree with this statement, but what they can agree on is that they are often asked what they were listening to at the time of recording the album. What inspired them to create a piece of work that has, in turn, inspired a lot of other musicians. As guitarist Kirk Hammett told an interviewer, there was no precedent for Master of Puppets. So in summer of 1985, when these songs were coming together, it was as if we were being visited by beings from another planet. That's what these songs felt like. They were so unique and so individual. No one had ever heard anything like this before that. We kind of knew, once we got the group of songs together, that we had a pretty strong pile of material to record. We were listening to a lot of The Misfits, a lot of Discharge, GBH. Cliff was listening to a lot of Velvet Underground, Leonard Skinner, Bach, and Stevie Ray Vaughan. He was really into Stevie when Stevie first showed up. He thought Stevie was a great player. I was listening to all that stuff, plus all the stuff I usually listen to all the German bands that I liked, and 70s hard rock. 
and the new wave of British heavy metal. Oh yeah, and a lot of Kate Bush too. We discovered Kate Bush around that time, and we love the police. We listened to the police all the time, because Cliff was a big fan of Stuart Copeland's drumming, and he loved the sound of his snare. He'd say, oh I love that snare. Drummer Lars Ulrich would also explain, it's funny, when we did Death Magnetic, Rick Rubin asked the exact same question. What were you listening to when you were writing Master of Puppets? And I can't tell you exactly what we were listening to, but I can tell you that most of the stuff that was still inspirational to us at that time is the stuff that we've talked a thousand times about. The new wave of British heavy metal, the Iron Maidens, the Thin Lizzies, the Motorheads. And then, as we were going through the 80s, everybody's horizons were expanding. We were starting to get into stuff like The Police and U2. I remember was this Yes album called 90125, and that was a great record. I can't tell you that we sat there listening to that record and then went out to the garage and started writing Master of Puppets, but it was part of that era. Cliff Burton, especially, brought a lot of new things that expanded our musical outlook. We were getting into ZZ Top for the first time, getting into The Misfits, and even finally appreciating Simon and Garfunkel for their amazing songwriting and harmony. So it was a period of pretty serious expansion. On the first two records, we were just listening to Diamond Head and Motorhead and Iron Maiden, and that was it. Number 5. Puppet Master Master of puppets, I'm pulling your strings, twisting your mind and smashing your dreams. Master of Puppets is one of Metallica's biggest songs. Many people would argue it's their best song of all time. But have you ever wondered what the song means? When I was quite young, I remember a block of cement near a corner in my neighborhood which had the words Master of Puppets etched into the sidewalk. I always figured this Master of Puppets was a character from a horror movie. Perhaps it was some demented version of Pinocchio. Or maybe they were simply singing a song about Jim Henson. I mean, he was undoubtedly a master of puppets, right? I mean, I thought that was the whole reason that he decided to put the letter M at the beginning of the word puppets. He's like, Ha ha, I'm the master of puppets, and these are my muppets. Well, I'm afraid the inspiration for the song is a tad more sinister. As the song describes drug addiction, James Hetfield wrote the song after attending a party in San Francisco where he witnessed some things that he would rather have not seen. As he told Rolling Stone, I just went to this party in San Francisco and there were a bunch of sick freaks shooting up and it made me sick. It's not about any drug in general, but people being controlled by drugs and not the other way around. While the inspiration for the song is fairly dark, James Hetfield was able to use the moment as a beacon of light to warn others. A light that would shine far and wide as the song would go down as number two in Rolling Stone's 100 Greatest Heavy Metal Songs of All Time. Second only behind Black Sabbath, Black Sabbath. While the lyrics are definitely memorable, many people credit the amazing guitar work for the success of the song. Former Metallica guitarist Dave Mustaine told Song Facts about the time he witnessed Lars Ulrich and James Hetfield create the song's iconic riff. I watched him on a piece of shit acoustic guitar write the opening riff. You know what that was? It was a guy with a guitar that doesn't know how to play. It wasn't anything really mind-blowing by any means. The way James played it made it mind-blowing. The song quickly became bassist Cliff Burton's favorite from the band's catalog as he explained in a 1986 interview. My favorite song is Master of Puppets. I think it's the best Metallica song yet. Some people describe the ebb and flow of the pacing in the song to describe the cycle of a drug addict. The song begins aggressive and frantic, like a drug addict seeking their next fix. Partway through the song, the listener descends into a beautiful lullaby of guitar solos, which might mimic the high portion of the drug cycle before crashing back down in a frenetic energy as the so-called master regains control of his puppet. Producer Fleming Rasmussen allegedly asked the band to tune their guitars lower than usual for the song so that it could be sped up in the mixing process, 
which was all done on tapes back in the mid 80s. That one took some time. There are a lot of different parts and melodies, but it's a primo song. We banged it out a couple times and decided on the one with the best feeling because they'd have to play it live. Now without letters. <laughs> Number six. Welcome back. How many songs re-enter the Billboard charts over 30 years after their initial release? Well, not many. A unique honor for Metallica's hit song, Master of Puppets, which regained popularity following its inclusion in a scene from the season 4 finale of the popular Netflix series, Stranger Things. The series was known for using popular music from the 80s to match the time period in which the show takes place. The show's producers, Matt and Ross Duffer, collectively known as the Duffer Brothers, wrote the song into the show's script as they felt the song was a must-have to help illustrate their vision. As the show's music supervisor, Nora Felder, explains, it was another one of those it has to be this song moments. This part of the story was anticipated to be a pivotal and especially hair-raising scene. I believe the Duffer Brothers felt that playing Master of Puppets throughout the extended scene was the clear choice. No other song was discussed further, and we jumped in to clear it straight away. I got in touch with Metallica's management office and carefully went over the scene and what the intent would be. I knew the clearance would be taken seriously as we had used one of their songs in Season 2 and had learned at that time that they were fans of the show. Master of Puppets is a pretty significant song in their catalog and I think it's considered a favorite in their live shows. I wanted to be respectful in making sure that Metallica fully understood what context the song was being used in, plus how integral it was to the scene and for this exciting new character, Eddie Munson, who no one had met yet in previous seasons. I mean, yeah, I guess I could see where something like Benny Hill theme music would not be appropriate for this particular scenario. The producers felt the scene shared similarities with Master of Puppets as the scene depicts a group of teenagers taking a stand against Vecna, the antagonist of Stranger Things Season 4. As Felder further explains, they share similarities in that they each have life-destroying powers that rob people of their essential personal powers. The aggressive up-tempo metal sound belies its cautionary psychological and socially conscious lyrics which are rooted in sensitive concern for others. Okay, whatever that means. It sounds like someone enjoys the corporate word salad, but I think I agree with what she's trying to say. Metallica rocks! And apparently Joseph Quinn rocks too, as the actor actually played the opening riff to the song as shown in the scene. As Nora would add, Yes, Joseph did take time to learn the guitar riff and was actually playing along to a guide track. Everyone thought he did a great job. Number 7. Stolen Guitar Riff Is Megadeth guitarist Dave Mustaine the Goblin King? Okay, hear me out. David Bowie starred in the 1986 film The Labyrinth, in which he steals a baby and taunts a young girl to get it back. He also wrote the song Ziggy Stardust, which includes the lyrics, Making love with his ego, Ziggy sucked up into his mind, like a leper messiah. Metallica took inspiration from David Bowie and named a song on Master of Puppets, Leper Messiah. Guitarist Dave Mustaine, who was kicked out of Metallica in 1983, would accuse Metallica of stealing some of his riffs on the song. He would also claim that drummer Lars Ulrich taunted him about the stolen riffs. Okay, well maybe that would make Lars the Goblin King. Or maybe I just wanted an excuse to do this. In any case, the former Metallica guitarist did indeed accuse his ex-bandmates of stealing some of his music. As he told Ultimate Guitar, 
I heard part of my stuff in Leper Messiah from the Master of Puppets album. I asked Lars about that, and they were saying that that was stuff that was written while I was in Metallica for Metallica Music. I get paid for it. I didn't get paid for Leper Messiah. I said, Lars, you're ripping me off. And he goes, yeah, I did it pretty well, huh? Guitarist Kirk Hammett would go on to deny any such allegations. As he explains, even though Dave might claim that he wrote Leper Messiah, he didn't. There's maybe a chord progression that was in that song, like maybe 10 seconds that came from him, that ironically is just before the guitar solo. But he did not write Leper Messiah at all. In fact, I remember being in the room when Lars came up with the main musical motif. We really both did come up with it. You know what? I believe you. You do? Yes. I believe that you believe you helped write that. That's how people like you work. Your ego is so out of whack that it will do whatever it can to protect itself. And people with a messed up ego can do these mental gymnastics to convince themselves they're awesome when really they're just douchebags. Number eight, burp. Behind the cover. Some people say a picture is worth a thousand words. In the case of Metallica's album cover for Master of Puppets, a picture is worth, oh, about thousand dollars. Not bad for a foreboding image depicting a row of tombstones with strings attached to a pair of red Puppet Master's hands in the sky. Artist Don Brodigam created the acrylic image using a combination of paintbrush and airbrush in just three days, while juggling other projects at the same time. Don was so overwhelmed with painting projects that he didn't even have time to listen to the album. In fact, he had never even heard a single Metallica song at the time he created the painting. Don has expressed sincere gratitude over his collaboration with Metallica in the years since the album's release. As he explains, when you had as many top-end jobs coming in as I did, you're forced to work at a grueling rate, but are still expected to produce nothing but the best artwork. It leaves a warm feeling in my heart to see the artwork that I did over 20 years ago plastered on t-shirts and posters all over the world. I hope it has something to do with the painting and not just the popularity of the band. Many people have speculated that the song Disposable Heroes was the inspiration for the soldier's helmet hanging on one of the tombstones. Perhaps the artist had a look at the track listing or maybe it was just a coincidence. In any case, Don Brodigam would unfortunately pass away on November 24, 2008. The original Master of Puppets artwork was auctioned off 10 months later by Christie's Auction House at Rockefeller Plaza in New York City. The final price, including buyer's fees, was $35,000. I like to imagine that the Master of Puppets painting now hangs somewhere in a rich grandpa's mansion where it frightens young children or people who believe in ghosts. Bonus, a not so fun fact. On September 27, 1986, the music world was struck with tragedy when Metallica's talented bassist, Cliff Burton, lost his life in a horrific accident at the young age of 24. The incident occurred while the band was on tour in Sweden, promoting their third studio album, Master of Puppets. Cliff Burton was asleep in a bunk location he specifically chose for himself by winning a contest to see who got to sleep in the bunk. Cliff Burton randomly pulled an ace of spades from a deck of cards, winning his preferred choice. To which Kirk said, Fine, I'll sleep up front. It's probably better anyway. The first card that Cliff picked was the ace of spades, and he looked at me and said, I want your bunk. And I said, Fine, you take my bunk, I'll sleep up front. That's probably better anyway, you know. <laughs> Singer James Hetfield chose to sleep in a lounge near the back of the bus because he didn't want cold air seeping in from the windows giving him a sore throat and affecting his singing voice. As a tour bus made its way through a remote area, it suddenly skid off the road and tumbled over, throwing a sleeping Cliff Burton through the window before landing on top of him, killing him instantly. As James Hetfield told an interviewer, My throat was going bad, so I was asleep in the back lounge. The tour buses you see here are all metal-sided, but it was all windows on the side, and that was the main cause of death. It hit so-called black ice, skidded out and bounced once. And that's when he went through the window, and the bus went right on him. It was pretty quick, and I know he didn't know what hit him. 
be overcorrected to get back onto the road. And as he did, the back end came around this way and it started chomp, chomp, chomp. It's the sound of screeching brakes and uh, being flipped around like a piece of clothes in a dryer. Reports differ as to what exactly caused the bus to skid off the road. The bus driver claims that the bus hit a patch of black ice. However, James Hetfield was quite skeptical. After pulling himself from the wreckage, he walked back and forth along the road looking for the so-called patch of black ice and was unable to find one. Police who investigated the scene were also unable to locate any patches of black ice on the road. Making matters worse, when the bus was being lifted by a crane so that paramedics could get to Cliff's body, the bus slipped and fell on Cliff a second time. A frustrated and confused James Hetfield explained, Coming out and finding your buddy under the bus is not something you want to go through. Our first reaction was anger, one of the things we're good at. Why did this happen? Where's the driver? Let me smell your breath. I walked for miles looking for this black ice in my underwear when it's 20 below. There were screams from the crew who were still trapped in there, screaming in pain, broken collarbones, toes, all that. What happened? You know, what's going on? You know, is this guy drunk? Or la la la. Oh, we hit some black ice. And I recall in my underwear, you know, and socks, walking for miles, looking for this black ice, walking back on. Where's this black ice? I don't see any black ice. And I wanted to kill this guy. I was gonna, I was gonna end him there. James Hetfield initially accused the driver of being drunk. But when speaking about the incident years later, other members of the band discussed the possibility that the driver may have fallen asleep. Local detective Arnie Peterson also believes that this may have been the case, as he claimed that the skid marks left at the scene of the accident resemble those of other accidents where the drivers had indeed fallen asleep. However, the driver claims that he had previously slept and was well rested. Although James was skeptical about what he was told, the driver of another bus that was carrying Metallica's gear agreed with the testimony provided by the driver of the bus that crashed. The mystery may never be officially solved, as the driver was ultimately determined to be not at fault, and no charges were ever pressed against him. As guitarist Kirk Hammett explains, It's one of those things you never learn the entire truth. We were all asleep when it happened. Who knows, maybe the driver was asleep too. Number 9. Deviled Hammett have you ever had a sandwich that could take a bite out of you? Well, Kirk Hammett did. A deviled ham sandwich, to be exact. Although he didn't eat it, because he had recently become a vegetarian before recording Metallica's Master of Puppets. The sandwich had been thrown at him by someone in the crowd during a festival performance. The photograph on the back of the album provides visual proof that a sandwich did indeed take a bite out of Kirk Hammett. Hey, look at this sandwich! It's gonna bite you! Ow! Damn sandwich took a bite out of me! Oh! As the guitarist explains, The back cover shot of me where I'm giving a dirty look to the camera? That was because I had just become a vegetarian back then, and we were at the Donington Festival. Someone threw a deviled ham sandwich from the audience and it smashed right on my brand new Black Jackson Flying V. And I was so pissed. I looked over to the side and I saw my guitar tech laughing. And I saw photographer Ross Halfin laughing. And I just gave them a dirty look. And then Ross took the shot. And that's the shot that's on the back of Master of Puppets. Which begs the question, did the person throw a deviled ham sandwich at Kirk Hammett because he was a vegetarian? Or was it because his last name is Ham it. Smashing idea, man. Yeah. Look out! Oh. That really hurt. I'm gonna have a lump there, you idiot. Who throws a sandwich? Honestly. Did you know that I do all of the editing for these videos by myself? Yep, that's right. Me. One person, including research, script writing, voiceovers, thumbnails, video editing, promotion. It's a lot of work and requires a full-time job for one person to handle, which I don't mind doing because I love being able to express my humor while also talking about the music that I enjoy. However, it would also be great to have some help improving my content, and that's where I need your help. 
The easiest way to support this channel is to click the like button. This will help the video get shown to more people. A better way to support this channel is to subscribe and hit the notification bell. This will help you get notified when we release new videos each week. And if you really want to make a big difference, check the description of this video for more ways that you can help this channel grow and support the creation of new content. If you like what we're doing, show us some love and let us know that you're out there. And let us know in the comments what your favorite album is. Perhaps we'll talk about it in a future video. Thank you all so much for your continued love and support. Number 10. Cliff Burton's Swan Song While the debate rages on about whether or not Metallica stole riffs from their former guitarist Dave Mustaine, one song that does indeed include stolen riffs is Orion. Although the culprit in this case was still an active member of the band at the time, as bassist Cliff Burton decided to turn one of Kirk Hammett's guitar solos into a bass solo while Kirk was out of town. As Kirk explains, I remember recording it in the studio, and then I left to go back to the East Coast and meet a girl or something. Cliff went back in the studio and used that area to put his own solo on it. But he played, like, half of my licks that were in the original solo. It was the weirdest thing. It wasn't really much of an issue for me, because there were like four other guitar solos in that song. It wasn't like he took the only one. Cliff Burton wrote such memorable music for Orion that the song would become associated with his memory. It was played at his funeral in 1986 and would later be turned into a tribute to Metallica's late bassist during live performances. As Kirk continues, For me, Orion was Cliff Burton's swan song. It was a great piece of music, and he'd written the whole middle section. It kind of gave us a view into what direction he was heading. Frontman James Hetfield would also have the notes of Cliff Burton's riff tattooed on his arm in memory of his friend and bandmate. You know, besides my kids' names and all of the other, I mean, they've obviously all got meanings, but this one is pretty important. And then Cliff, you know, this is Clifford Lee Burton, and this is uh, the middle bit to Orion, the bass part. Doodly, doody, 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 doody. Oh man. No, that's right. <laughs> Whopper, 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 Junior Double, Triple Whopper. Get me a Whopper. Did you know why frontman James Hetfield tuned his guitar down on Metallica's Load and Reload albums? Or that there is a disgusting story behind the making of the album covers? What about the popular singer and actress that drank with Metallica in the studio? Stick around as we answer these questions and more on... 10 Fun Facts About Load and Reload by Metallica Number 1. Tuning Down All songs on Metallica's Load were recorded in E-flat. The band had previously recorded individual songs in E-flat or lower, but Load would be the first time that they recorded an entire album this way. For those of you who are not musicians, the traditional standard tuning of a guitar begins in the key of E. Some musicians prefer to tune their guitars down a half step to E flat because it can be easier for a singer with a lower voice to sing along with. It can also make performing those screeching heavy metal solos a tad bit easier as tuning a guitar down loosens up the strings a little bit, allowing them more flexibility to bend. Most songs on Reload would also be recorded in E flat with the exception of Devil's Dance and Bad Seed, which were tuned even lower to D and D flat. As guitarist Kirk Hammett explains, I started tuning to E flat for my riff tapes because I copied a lot of Hendrix stuff. You know, I used to try to figure out Jimi Hendrix solos, Stevie Ray Vaughan solos, Thin Lizzy solos, and those three bands tuned to E flat, and so a lot of my riffs were in E flat. And I guess when James would hear the riffs tuned in E flat and he'd try to sing to them, I think he kind of liked it. He liked the break it kind of gave his voice. He didn't have to pitch that extra half step. And that's also why on both Load and Reload, the primary tuning is E flat rather than E. Once there was 
Cause it's Keanu. Number two, behind the album cover. Have you ever looked at the album art for Metallica's Load or Reload and wondered what the heck it was supposed to be? Perhaps you were like me and assumed it was an abstract painting of a flame or maybe a lava lamp. Well, I'm afraid that the answer is something far more disgusting. In fact, the artwork isn't a painting at all. The image was created by artist Andre Serrano, who was creating a series of artistic photographs with bodily fluids. The image used for Metallica's load was made by mixing bovine blood with, well, let's just say he mixed it with his own happy creamy feelings before he smashed the mixture between two sheets of glass and took a picture of it. Sometimes our happy, creamy feeling just gets so full it comes out at night. I was having happy dreams about a girl. All right, butters, let's it's happy feelings. Let's just not talk about it. Okay, Dad. Ooh, save that for later. And suddenly the title "Load" makes me feel much more uncomfortable. The image for "Reload" was created using the same bovine blood mixed with a yellow liquid. I'll let you guess what that yellow liquid is and where it came from. It's pee! Look out for the pee! Artist Andre Serrano spoke with Metal Hammer in 2022. It was Kirk and Lars who asked for the picture for load. I met with them at Paula Cooper Gallery in New York, and we arranged for them to use the image for the album, merchandise, and all promotional purposes. I was flattered and honored they wanted it because it spoke to them. They were drawn to it and I'm glad they were because the image and album was a match made in heaven. It was part of a series called Bodily Fluids. They were photographs intended to look like paintings. I bought the blood at the butcher. It would be labeled edible beef blood and I would buy a gallon of it whenever I needed it. The blood would darken after a day so I thought I needed fresh blood to get the bright red. Later, someone told me to put the dark blood in a blender and it would brighten up again. I think the images were a hit. I read a review once where the Load album was named number one on the list of best album covers. We know Lars and Kirk were happy with it, but James was not. I think James is still fuming. I feel like I'm gonna explode here! <laughs> Frontman James Hetfield was a tad uncomfortable with the artwork, but he was a good sport and went along with the concept, which had been picked out by guitarist Kirk Hammett after he discovered Serrano's work on the music video for Crush My Soul by Godsmack. As Hetfield told Classic Rock Magazine, the whole cover thing, it went against what I was feeling. How can I put this? Lars and Kirk were very into abstract art, pretending they were gay. I think they knew it bugged me. It was a statement around all that. I love art, but not for the sake of shocking others. I think the cover of Load was just a piss take around all that. I just went along with the makeup and all of this crazy stupid shit they felt they needed to do. In regards to using the same artist and concept for Reload, Hetfield had this to say. I hated it, but it had to match. It's a matching hatred. I'm not a big fan of the man and his perversions. There's art, and then there's just sick MFers, and he's one of them. The thing is, they belong together. I don't care if the guy blows donkeys. The art had to match. I'm being creative. Now if you'll excuse me, I still have some work to do. Oh, poor twisted me. Oh, poor twisted me. Oh, oh, oh. Number three, identity crisis. Some people say that change is a good thing. However, the heavy metal community in 1996 was not one of these people. Many people were quite bothered by the fact that Metallica changed their image for Load by altering their logo and, well, this would also mark the first time that fans would see Metallica without their signature long heavy metal hair, and fans were not very happy. This wasn't helped by the fact that the inner artwork for Load featured photos of the band members in a variety of outfits which felt more like something out of Vogue or Cosmopolitan magazine, such as this white tank top and suspenders look. James Hetfield deflected blame towards his bandmates, claiming it was all their decision. Lars and Kirk drove on those records. The whole we need to reinvent ourselves topic was up. Image is not an evil thing for me, but if the image is not you, then it doesn't make much sense. I think they were really after a U2 kind of vibe, 
Bono doing his alter ego. I couldn't get into it. The whole, okay, now in this photo shirt we're going to be 70s glam rockers, like what? I would say half, at least half. The pictures that were to be in the booklet, I yanked out. The whole cover thing, it went against what I was feeling. The Metallica frontman would later go on to say, There always has to be some kind of compromise, especially when you've got four guys in a band. You've got two guys that are really driving the thing, Lars and myself, and when we don't agree, there has to be a compromise. The load and reload era, for me, was one of those. I wasn't 100% on with it, but I would say that that was a compromise. I said, I'm going with Lars and Kirk's vision on this. You guys are extremely passionate about this, so I'll jump on board. Because if the four of us are into it, it's going to be better. So I did my best with it, and it didn't pan out as good as I was hoping. But, again, there's no regrets. Because at the time, it felt like the right thing to do. We don't like boundaries and limits. Heavy Metal has the impression that it's a bit punk, like, F the world, and we're us, we're doing things our way. And that's fine, until you don't fit into their way. You know, cutting your hair, or not wearing a leather jacket, or whatever. Doing a ballad. That was one of the things that set us apart right away. I remember almost getting in a fight with a fan in San Francisco, and the guy said, F you, you sell out, you did a video for MTV and blah blah blah. I felt the need to defend us. It's like, why do I need to justify our art to you? It disappointed us that fans would get angry at you for being an artist, or doing what you feel you want to do to explain yourself to the world, or to connect with the world. Steven, I didn't, I didn't sell out, son, I bought in. Keep that in mind. In a separate interview, James would add, Fast thrash just wasn't exciting to us anymore, really. If I wrote it, then we'd use it. But none of us were writing that stuff. On Fuel, there was some pretty quick downpicking, just kind of moving around with the root notes, but that's about it. It was a little more exciting for us to figure out more effed up chords, things that grind, dissonant in bits. In a few of the songs, there's helter-skelter tension built in there. That kind of stuff excited us more than the speed stuff. Want to hear some music? <laughs> oh, right. Rock Number four, no double album. Metallica originally wanted to release Load and Reload as a double album. However, once the band began working on the material, they decided it was best if they made two separate albums instead. Load was recorded over 10 months at The Plant in Sausalito, California, between May 1995 and February 1996, with the album released on June 4th. Metallica would take any leftover material back to the same studio in July of 1997, where they spent the following three or four months fleshing out what would become Reload, released in November of that year. Guitarist Kirk Hammett spoke with Guitar World. We were going to do them both as a double album, but we didn't want to spend that long in the studio. Also, if we did a double album, it would have been a lot more material for people to digest, and some of it might have gotten lost in the shuffle. Number 5. Dr. No. Producer Bob Rock has worked with a variety of talented artists, including Motley Crue, Aerosmith, and David Lee Roth. He also had great results working with Metallica on their self-titled Black album. So Metallica brought him back to work on their fifth and sixth studio album, Load and Reload. However, this decision didn't come without its own little controversy. Metallica are a no-nonsense band and often enter the studio knowing exactly what they want to create. This can bother some producers, who often like to have some creative input on the albums they work on. Bob Rock once referred to James Hetfield as Dr. No, because he was always saying no to the producer's suggestions. Hello. No. No what? No. Well, all right then, be like that. Here, swallow this. As he told Louder Sound, there's always a warming up period on every project and uh, it just took a while longer with them. They had one way of doing things, and they didn't really trust outsiders. Not just me, they were suspicious of everybody. 
I can say that I'd never been involved with people who were as intense as them. But the tensions came when I challenged them or they challenged me. It was never personal. But the thing is, I never said, no, you're wrong. I just showed them other ways to potentially get what they wanted. It's well known that by the end, both engineer Randy Staub and I said we didn't want to work with them again. But that's because we were so beat. Eight months in that environment would test anyone. But some of the best work comes out of tension. With all the great bands, Jagger and Richards in The Stones, Steven Tyler and Joe Perry in Aerosmith, there's friction. Metallica are not wimps. They believe that they're the best band in the world and everyone else needs to get out of the way. In this industry, when something has the impact that the Black Album did, it only makes sense to put that team back together. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. The previous sessions were intense, but when we started Load, we put all that had happened behind us and moved on. To be clear, I have lots of happy memories from the Black Album too. They're great people to hang out with, and we had a lot of fun. My 15 years working with Metallica were some of the best times of my life. Feeling better? No! What a lot of lovely comics you've got. Do you like them? No. Right. Number 6. Man Bear Pig. I'm serial. Some people say that Man Bear Pig isn't real. Well, I'm here to tell you now, Man Bear Pig is very real, and he most certainly exists. I'm serial. Man Bear Pig doesn't care who you are or what you've done. Man Bear Pig simply wants to get you. I'm super serial. Seriously, what is that thing? The music video for Until It Sleeps has always tripped me out with the weird man pig creature that gave me the heebie-jeebies as a late night MTV watching youngster in the mid 90s. One of those things where as much as it creeps you out, you also can't help but look at it either. I've always felt that the monster represented addiction or some kind of darkness deep down within a person. Allegedly, James Hetfield wrote the song while reflecting on childhood trauma surrounding his mother who battled cancer until it took her life when James was only 16 years old. Metallica's surreal music video for the song is inspired by the paintings of Hieronymus Bosch. Is that pronounced Bosch or Bosch? A funny story, my parents used to take my sister and I to Old Town San Diego when we were kids. We would usually go to one of the delicious Mexican food restaurants in the area, and while we were waiting for a seat, us kids would go play around on a replica cannon that was on display in the courtyard. My sister and I got confused as all heck when my buddy started yelling, BOSH! Now, I don't know what that particular kid's childhood was like, but I guess I would have used words like kaboom or pow when playing with a cannon. Not BOSH, but anyways. Fire in the hole. BOSH! 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 The music video for Until It Sleeps was directed by Samuel Bayer, who has made a lot of memorable music videos for major rock bands such as Green Day's American Idiot, Don't wanna be an American Idiot. or Bullet with Butterfly Wings by Smashing Pumpkins. And Welcome to the Black Parade by My Chemical Romance. To join the Black Parade. Among many, many more. Can you guess which music video Samuel Baird direct for Nirvana? If you're like me and guess that it was Heart Shaped Box, Where do I take this pain of mine? based on the use of similar surrealistic religious imagery and themes, you would be incorrect. He actually directed the music video for Smells Like Teen Spirit. Hey! While working on Until It Sleeps, Sam took inspiration from a handful of Bosch paintings, most notably a work called The Garden of Earthly Delights, a painting known as a triptych, which features three panels of related artwork. The first panel portrays the Garden of Eden. I don't know what kind of gospel this man is spreading, but he seems to be having quite a profound experience. 
The middle panel portrays humans enjoying their time on Earth, doing a lot of, oh, shall we call them shenanigans? The third and final panel represents hell, where we can find the man-bird frog monster eating people that Metallica borrowed for the third act of the music video. Mmm, yum yum. Thank you for cutting your hair. Now I can digest you. Now that I think about it, the man-bear pig creature may represent the biblical Adam's original sin, as the pig beast can be seen with an apple in his mouth, which had earlier been hanging on the tree at the beginning of the video. Or maybe it's just a barbecue reference. Yeah, and meat to sweet as summer's wafting breeze. Can I have some? My knees are open only to the pleas of those who speak ye old English. Where do I take this pain of mine? I run, but it stays right by my side. Whatever. Number seven, Exit Sandman. Whopper, 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 junior double, triple whopper. Get me a whopper. Be careful what you wish for, because you just might get it, appears to be the theme that surrounds Metallica's King Nothing, a song about somebody so obsessed with fame and power that he doesn't care about anything else and will stop at nothing to achieve their goal, all the while oblivious to the fact that their fame and power ultimately means very little. The music video focuses on a king, or well, let's just call him a guy with a Burger King crown. as he wanders around the middle of absolutely nowhere, tossing his crown aside only to go full on Bugs Bunny by pulling an identical crown out of nowhere and placing it back upon his head, until he throws that one on the ground too, and the cycle continues. Technically, the middle of nowhere was Park City, Utah, where the video was filmed by director Matt Mahirin. You may recognize some other music videos he's created, including Primal Scream by Motley Crue. Little Things by Bush or Angry Chair by Alice in Chains He also worked with Metallica previously on their video for The Unforgiven and would work with them again for the music video of The Unforgiven 2 because who else would you get to direct a sequel music video to a sequel song other than the man who directed the first one? Oh, are you one Fans have speculated whether Metallica are singing about themselves due to the lines Off to Never Neverland sung at the end of King Nothing. Which were borrowed from Enter Sandman, which was one of Metallica's chart-topping singles from their previous self-titled album. Metallica were arguably the kings of thrash metal at the time. Perhaps the band felt that this title ultimately didn't mean much as they elected to take their music in a different direction for load and reload. One fan in particular suggests that James Hetfield was messing around with playing the Enter Sandman guitar riff backwards, which evolved into the riff for King Nothing. I'm not sure if this is true or not, but I do think I can hear a little bit of a resemblance between the two songs. Can you? Number 8, Burt. Getting Personal with lyrics that read, I am the priest that feeds the beast. I am the blood. I am release. I am the priest that feeds the beast. And, I'm sowing the seeds I take for granted. This thorn in my side is from the tree I've planted. This thorn in my side is from the tree I've planted. Bleeding Me is perhaps one of James Hetfield's most personal songs ever written as a songwriter opens up about his struggles with alcohol addiction and recovery. As he told Playboy in 2001, Around the time of Load, I felt I wanted to stop drinking. 
Maybe I'm missing out on something. Everyone else seems happy all the time. I want to get happy. I'd plan my life around a hangover. The misfits are playing in town on Friday night, so Saturday is hangover day. I lost a lot of days in my life. Going to therapy for a year, I learned a lot about myself. There is a lot of things that scar you when you're growing up, and you don't know why. The song Bleeding Me is about that. I was trying to bleed out all bad, get the evil out. While I was going through therapy, I discovered some ugly stuff in there, a dark spot. I took more than a year off from drinking, and the skies didn't part. It was just life, but less fun. The evil didn't come out. I wasn't laughing, wasn't having a good time. I realized drinking is a part of me. Now I know how far to go. You can't be hung over when you got kids, man. Dad, get the F off the couch. Well, they don't say that, yet. This really goes beyond my training as a furniture salesman, sir. Now, if you don't want the sofa, I'll have to ask you to leave. Number nine, Soaked in Whiskey. The Memory Remains is a song that was written during the 1995 Load Sessions, but would not be fully completed until 1997 as the first single for Reload. Fortune Fame, Mirror Vein, Gone Insane, But The Memory Remains. Fortune Fame, Mirror Vein, Gone Insane, But The Memory Remains. The song describes a Hollywood celebrity who has long outlived their 15 minutes of fame. And whom else would come to mind when thinking of washed up movie stars besides Marianne Faithful? After her breakup with Mick Jagger from the Rolling Stones, her career was never quite the same. Okay, I'm kidding, but I really don't know much about Marianne Faithful other than she was a popular singer and actress from the 60s with a distinctive voice that had allegedly developed as a result of either laryngitis or years of drug abuse, possibly even a combination of the two. This unique vocal characteristic was dubbed whiskey soaked by some critics. It was also this unique vocal characteristic that caused producer Bob Rock to recommend Marianne to perform guest vocals on The Memory Remains because he felt her voice would be a good fit for the song. As James Hetfield told an interviewer, We needed a real character, been through it all voice. We got a hold of her and she agreed to do it. So we flew to Dublin on the way to Belgium. We met up with her in the studio went in and got her drunk, and then she sang this bit. It was perfect. She definitely had the voice, and it created a real eerie vibe. <laughs> Marianne Faithful would also join Metallica on stage to perform the song for Saturday Night Live on December 6, 1997. Did you know that I do all of the editing for these videos by myself? Yep, that's right, me, one person, including research, script writing, voiceovers, thumbnails, video editing, promotion. It's a lot of work and requires a full-time job for one person to handle, which I don't mind doing because I love being able to express my humor while also talking about the music that I enjoy. However, it would also be great to have some help improving my content, and that's where I need your help. The easiest way to support this channel is to click the like button this will help the video get shown to more people. A better way to support this channel is to subscribe and hit the notification bell. This will help you get notified when we release new videos each week. And if you really want to make a big difference, check the description of this video for more ways that you can help this channel grow and support the creation of new content. If you like what we're doing, show us some love and let us know that you're out there. And let us know in the comments what your favorite album is. Perhaps we'll talk about it in a future video. Thank you all so much for your continued love and support. Number 10. Don't Go Jason Waterfall. Don't go Jason Waterfalls. Load and Reload would mark the final albums with Jason Newstead on bass, who had joined the band in 1988 prior to releasing And Justice For All. He had replaced the deceased bassist Cliff Burton. Wow, if you want to hear a tragic story, Take a peek at our video about the death of Cliff Burton. The poor guy was thrown through a window of a bus as it crashed and flipped over on top of him during Metallica's Damage Inc. tour in 1986. But that's more of a not so fun fact about Master of Puppets. If you want to learn more about that, check out our video link in the description. As for Jason Newstead, 
The story of his departure starts to tread more into territory that we will cover when we discuss St. Anger. So I won't go into too much detail, but in 2001, Newstead had become more interested in working on his own side project, Echo Brain. This led to some tension between himself and James Hetfield, which almost broke up Metallica. Instead, Jason announced his departure from Metallica on January 17, 2001. He would later go on tour with Ozzy Osbourne, Voivod, and Who Cares, among other projects, before forming his own band called Newstead. Although, he would return to perform a few songs with Metallica at their Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction ceremony on April 4, 2009. He would also join the band on stage for all four of their 30th anniversary shows. So he has remained in touch and on good terms with his former colleagues despite the breakup. As he told Rolling Stone in 2009, I tell you very honestly, 1 billion percent, I have never regretted leaving Metallica. It was the right thing for everyone. It was the right thing to do for the camp. That's it. I've never told anyone that I wanted to go back or anything like that. Not once. I made up my mind. It was not an easy thing to do, but it was something I had to do. I thought about it very much before I pulled the trigger. And because of that, I have never looked back. The past is where it's supposed to be. You look like you've got something to say. Do you? Yes, I certainly do. I have to go now. My planet needs me. Did you know that St. Anger is the only Metallica album produced without a bassist? Or that James Hetfield put the album production on hold for almost a year so that he could address a personal issue? What about the popular musician who claimed St. Anger is the only album he's taken back to the record store? Stick around as we answer these questions and more on 10 Fun Facts About St. Anger by Metallica. Number 1. No Bass Bassist Jason Newstead never really received fair credit during his tenure with Metallica. He joined the band after beloved bassist Cliff Burton died tragically in an accident involving Metallica's tour bus while on tour supporting Master of Puppets. Fans would eventually learn to embrace him and what he did for the band during a run of four highly successful albums, but they were initially apprehensive and somewhat apathetic towards him. This wasn't helped by the fact that on his first album with the band, Metallica turned the volume of his bass guitar down so low that you really can't even hear him. People frequently joke about, and Justice For All, being the Metallica album without bass, even though it would be St. Anger, in which the band technically didn't have a bassist. That job would be performed in the studio by producer Bob Rock. Some of you might be thinking, wait a minute, I thought Robert Trujillo joined Metallica for St. Anger. Well, you are correct. However, he would join the band after St. Anger had already been finished. Robert had no creative input on the songs written for St. Anger, but Metallica still gave him a credit in the album's liner notes to help make him an official member of the band, a title he still holds as of the making of this video. After having some of his creative ideas shot down by Metallica, Jason Newstead was looking outside of the band for ways to express himself. One of these ideas include the formation of his band Echo Brain. This caused a rift between Jason and Metallica frontman James Hetfield, who was concerned that the project would interfere with Metallica. When Metallica's management at Q Prime began discussing the idea of promoting Jason's Echo Brain album, James contacted management and pressured them to drop support of Jason's album. As Jason explains, And so they had told me pretty convincingly, this is a great record. We've been playing it around the office. It's fantastic. This kid has a great voice. Let's do something with this. 
That's what they told me. And then James heard about it and was not happy. He was, I think, pretty much out to put the kibosh on the whole thing because it would somehow affect Metallica in his eyes because now the managers were interested in something I was doing that had nothing to do with him. I have no idea what he was thinking other than just protecting what he valued, just like he does. That's his thing. He protects what he loves, squeezes it too hard. That's where I was coming from. The people that I had counted on for 15 years to help me with my career, help Metallica, take care of my money, do all those things, told me, your new project is fantastic. We'd like to help you with it. James heard about it. The manager called me back a couple days later. Sorry, we're not going to be able to help you with that Echo Brain thing. During a band meeting in early January of 2001, Jason suggests that Metallica should take a year-long break, which would allow Jason time to pursue his side project. This idea was also shot down by James Hetfield. Tired of having his creative ideas shot down, in January 17, 2001, Jason Newstead announced his resignation from Metallica, quitting the band after 15 years and four studio albums. Drummer Lars Ulrich spoke with an interviewer just two years after Jason's departure and expressed a bit of sorrow over how Jason was treated during his tenure with Metallica. Jason was overlooked, and the ironic thing is that the model for what would have been the perfect Metallica in Jason's mind is the one that exists now. That is kind of ironic. It's also a little sad, because Jason's a good guy, and he put a lot of effort into the band for many years, and in retrospect, he was never really fully accepted into the band. Then, when he tried to go elsewhere to satisfy his creative needs, he was told, well, barked at, that he couldn't. Fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, you're cool. James Hetfield would also express a bit of sorrow over the way he handled things with Jason while he was in the band, often suffocating any of Jason's creative ideas out of fear of surrendering even the slightest bit of control of this musical behemoth that Metallica had become. It must have been very bittersweet for him, like a dream come true, by stepping into someone's shoes who can never be filled. It must have been very difficult for him. James would reflect upon the experience while writing lyrics for the song All Within My Hands, which would be the closing track on St. Anger. Squeeze it in, crush it down, all within my hands. Love is control, I'll die if I let go. Now one might think that a person would regret leaving a band as big as Metallica, but Jason Newstead had given the idea a lot of thought. When he spoke with an interviewer over a decade after his departure, Jason explained that he has always been quite comfortable with his decision. I tell you very honestly, one billion percent, I have never regretted leaving Metallica. It was the right thing for everyone. It was the right thing to do for the camp. That's it. I've never told anyone that I wanted to go back or anything like that. Not once. I made up my mind. It was not an easy thing to do, but it was something I had to do. I thought about it very much before I pulled the trigger, and because of that, I have never looked back. The past is where it's supposed to be. You look like you've got something to say. Do you? Yes, I certainly do. I have to go now. My planet needs me. Jason remains close friends with his former bandmates and even joined them on stage for Metallica's Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction ceremony on April 4th, 2009. He has also performed with Metallica at several events over the years including all four of the band's 30th anniversary shows in December 2011. Number 2. St. Christopher What does St. Christopher have to do with Metallica? Well, not much, other than the fact that James Hetfield once saw guitarist Kirk Hammett wearing a St. Christopher's medallion on his necklace. Known as the patron saint of travelers, the St. Christopher's medallion may be given to someone to wish them luck in their travels. This particular medallion, worn by Kirk, featured a surfer on the flip side of the medallion, which symbolized to Kirk good blessings while he was surfing. As James looked at Kirk's medallion, he invented a patron saint of his own, Saint Anger, a patron saint who guides James Hetfield to use his anger productively, such as channeled through his music, rather than destructively, such as drinking. The band enjoyed the concept so much that they decided to title their 8th studio album, St. Anger. As Kirk explains, 
James and I were just sitting in the, uh, the control room, and I had a St. Christopher's medallion around my neck. And he asked me what it was. I said, oh, you know, it's a St. Christopher's medallion. And I explained to him, you know, St. Saint Christopher is the patron saint of, of travelers. This particular medallion I had was a St. Christopher's medallion, but on the flip side, I had a surfer. And so what, what, what that signifies is, you know, whenever you go out surfing, you know, this medallion will, will, will give you good blessings so that you'll actually come back. And, you know, I explained that to him, and he was, he was like, wow. And then all of a sudden he said, St. Anger. And I go, that's killer. Number three, Hetfield goes to rehab. Metallica began working on St. Anger in April 2001. However, production would get delayed when James Hetfield checked himself into rehab to address his addiction to alcohol. Known for their willingness to indulge while on tour, guitarist Kirk Hammett described what it was like when he joined the band. When I first met these guys, they were drinking vodka like it was water. I would start drinking about 12 in the afternoon, we would arrive at the club and go straight to the bar and see how much booze we could consume for free. And by the time we went out on stage, we were almost always sauced. It became part of our legend. People would know when we were coming into town to stock their bars and make sure there was always a lot of booze for us to drink. As the years went on, members of the band matured and many of them gradually toned down their drinking and partying. Not James, however. Following the departure of bassist Jason Newstead, who left the band in no small part due to creative differences with Hetfield, James began to reflect on his own abusive behavior. As James has often admit that he was quite controlling of the band and often suffocated many of Jason's ideas out of fear of surrendering any semblance of control of this monstrous behemoth that had become Metallica. Was Jason Newstead's departure the straw that broke the Hetfield's back and forced him to dive deep within himself to address the inner demons that caused him to drive a beloved band member away? Perhaps. I mean, I'm sure it was a piece of the complex puzzle that makes up a person like James Hetfield. As drummer Lars Ulrich confessed, Jason is the only member of Metallica who has ever left willingly. That in itself is a statistic, and the resentment from James and I was just so, you can't do that, you can only leave if we want you to leave and then we weren't equipped at the time to do a deep dive into why he was leaving. You can see 20 years later, it makes complete sense. We write the songs, we make the decisions, we do all of it. You have no creative outlet in this band. You have no creative voice. Then when you go and do something that gives you satisfaction in a way for you to express yourself to the rest of the world, then we get pissed at you. Then that resentment then goes to you leaving the band. James Hetfield himself has also explained that the initial writing sessions without Jason Newstead in the band were not as fruitful as they had been in years prior. After a few months of working on the album and not going anywhere, James Hetfield made the tough decision to check himself into treatment. He would return to the studio in May 2002. Following what would be the first of many trips to rehab, James Hetfield had this to say. Recovery is the most difficult and challenging thing I've ever attempted, along with parenting. It's also the most grounding and gratifying gift I've ever received, along with parenting. My music and lyrics have always been a therapy for me. Without this God-given gift, I don't know where I'd be. Now I truly feel the impact and connection they have made with others. Struggle to struggle, pain to pain, human to human, not idol to fan, fan to idol. Clarity has put me in a humble and serene place to receive this connection in return and feel it helping heal me. Every breath I take becomes deeper and I become more confident of myself without my crutches. The lies I've filled my body and soul with aren't needed anymore. They're not welcome. I choose to live, not just exist. Oh, glory of glories. Oh, heavenly testament to the eternal majesty of God's creation. Holy macaroni! Number 4. Happy Family When James Hetfield returned from his first stint in rehab in 2002, one of the first things Metallica did was record a handful of Ramones cover songs. 
These songs would include We're a Happy Family, Cretan Hop, Now I Want to Sniff Some Glue, Today Your Love, Tomorrow the World, Commando, and 53rd and 3rd. I eat green berets for breakfast. And right now I'm very hungry. The last of those songs would be included on a Ramones tribute album co-produced by Rob Zombie called We're a Happy Family, a tribute to the Ramones. Some of the other songs would find their way to the public's ears as B-sides on Metallica singles. A special note to any vinyl collectors out there, as a blue 7-inch vinyl featuring Metallica's cover of 53rd and 3rd can be found paired with two more Ramones cover songs by Green Day and Offspring. If you're into that sort of thing, this record seems to be quite hard to find and is very valuable due to its rarity. Metallica would submit their version of 53rd and 3rd to the album's producers on June 5, 2002, a day that would take special significance due to the fact that original founding member and bassist D.D. Ramone had passed away, unbeknownst to Metallica. Co-producer of Metallica's 2004 documentary Some Kind of Monster, Joe Berlinger noted that guitarist Kirk Hammett was visibly spooked by the coincidence, as he told the media, He was noticeably pale. That is fucked up, he said. That is fucked up. He got up and left the room. Number 5. The Wrong Way Quite often, a band arrives in the studio with at least some material already prepared. Songwriters tend to have a habit of writing new music while on tour, supporting the music they've already written. I mean, when you're traveling on the road for hours every day, it can be a great way to kill time. And the fact that they are on stage performing nearly every night means that the songwriter's brain is already functioning in music mode. So why not pick up a guitar while sitting in the back of a van heading from Flagstaff to Albuquerque and jot some new ideas down? Metallica is no stranger to this concept. I don't need anyone telling me play on words. I'm a motherfucking lyrical wordsmith, motherfucking genius. Quite often, frontman James Hetfield and drummer Lars Ulrich would get together to flesh out a tune, and they would bring it to the studio to teach the other band members. But this would not be the case on St. Anger, as Metallica intentionally entered the studio without anything pre-written. They wanted this album to be raw, spontaneous, and the result of a group effort, even if that group was missing one of the four contributing pieces. As producer Bob Rock explains, the idea is it should sound like a band getting together in the garage for the first time, only the band's Metallica. After Metallica's group effort had created enough songs, producer Bob Rock sat down with all of the material and began stitching it together like Dr. Frankenstein, cutting out parts of songs and rearranging them in his music production software. A lot of the songs were done in William Burroughs' cut-and-paste fashion, there are movements in movie making and in music where you take technology as an art and you actually abuse it. Some people use Pro Tools to trick and fool the listener, but we used it more as a creative tool to do something interesting and stretch boundaries. Technically, you'll hear symbols go away and you'll hear bad edits. We wanted to disregard what everybody assumes records should be and throw out all the rules. I've spent 25 years learning how to do it the so-called right way I didn't want to do that anymore. Hey, hey, hey! Who rules? Rules! 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 Results were mixed, as many fans, including James Hetfield himself, have admitted that St. Anger is not exactly their favorite album. As he told Metal Hammer, For me, St. Anger kind of stands alone. It's more of a statement than an album. It's more of the soundtrack to the movie, in a way. There's some really interesting and cool riffs, some great songs in there, but sonically it sounds fragmented, which is exactly where we were at that point. But in that fragmentation, it brought us together. So it was a very necessary piece of the puzzle to get us where we are today. Number 6. No Guitar Solo Frontman James Hetfield admits that the songwriting on St. Anger suffered a hit with the departure of bassist Jason Newstead. The album would be the only Metallica studio release to feature the band as a three-piece. As a result, the band decided that they wanted to record something a bit more raw and stripped down, 
even going so far as to avoid including guitar solos. Not a single one can be found anywhere on the album. As guitarist Kirk Hammett explains, the reason for that is because again, we wanted to move together all four of us in the same musical direction. When we tried to put overdubs on the album and put guitar solos on the album, it sounded like an afterthought, you know? Like something was put on after we created it. It stood out. We wanted to preserve the sound of all four of us in a room just jamming, spontaneously together. To put production stuff on top of that just didn't sound right. Some guitarists might frown at the idea of their soloing skills not being showcased on an album, particularly a heavy metal album. However, Kirk didn't mind. When asked if he was happy with the way the album came out, he told an interviewer, Oh yeah, absolutely. I'm so proud of this album, it freaks me out. I haven't been this proud of an album since the Black Album, I must say. I mean, the Load and Reload era for us was such a reaction to our first five albums. We didn't want to do what we had been doing, play fast, over the top, and aggressive. If anything, the Load and Reload era was a big experiment in hard rock. We needed to do these albums for us to make Saint Anger. If we would have made Saint Anger in the mid 90s, it wouldn't have been fresh and as exciting for us as it was now. It would have felt like doing the same old thing. We needed to balance it out. When we finally got around playing fast and aggressive again, it sounded fresh. You need to get to point A to be able to make point B sound better, you know? Are you gonna miss your solos? No. No? <laughs> oh, don't cry, are you? <laughs> Number seven, Lars left out. It's my party and I'll make Lars cry if I want to, said Kirk Hammett. Okay, I take that back. He never said such a thing. Those are my words and my words only. However, the recording period for Metallica's Saint Anger was definitely a very tense time for the band. So tense, in fact, that somebody forgot to inform drummer Lars Ulrich about plans to celebrate guitarist Kirk Hammett's 40th birthday party. When he showed up at the studio only to discover everyone dressed in tropical theme for the party, complete with Hawaiian shirts and lays, Lars felt left out. He did leave us with some juicy quotes as he took his plate of food to sulk in another room. As Some Kind of Monster co-producer Joe Berlinger explains, Lars felt snubbed and stalked into another room with a plate of food to eat in silence. Nobody throws me a birthday party, he sulked. Life is an eternal birthday party for someone else, he said. Then added, um, let's just say, life is a limp hoo-ha with an occasional derpy doo and hey, I've said it before and I'll say it again, but YouTube often feels like it's run by Puritans. So pardon my, uh, censorship. My mom always said, life was like a box of hoo-ha. Number eight, Burt, St. Dirt. Was Fred Durst inspired by Metallica's St. Anger to take Limp Bizkit's music in a different direction on their 2000 release, Results May Vary? Maybe it was simply the departure of guitarist Wes Borland, but when Limp Bizkit postponed the release of their album shortly after Lars Ulrich had played a handful of St. Anger songs for The Man in the Red Hat, he and Kirk Hammett speculated whether or not their music had an influence on Durst. I have a suspicion that once this album drops and people hear it everywhere, I just have this suspicion that bands are gonna get heavier and start playing faster again. I just have a suspicion that they are. I'll tell you one thing, Lars played Fred Durst four songs of our new album, and the next week, Fred Durst postponed the release of the new Limp Bizkit album and started rewriting it. Lars and I were talking about it. Did he postpone it because he wasn't satisfied with it? Or did he postpone it because he heard our direction and wanted to be contemporary with it? It's interesting, we'll see. Number 9. Wrath of Chuck Some fans were quite upset over the new direction Metallica took with St. Anger. One of those angry fans was Testament frontman Chuck Billy, 
who slammed the release while stating that it is the only record he has ever taken back to the store and asked for a refund. As Chuck himself explains, I'm a huge Metallica fan, especially the early stuff had a big influence on me. James Hetfield's vocals, his songwriting, and his style always has inspired me. I think once they got to that load period of their career, once everyone started sharing writing the vocals and everyone contributing in the uh, psychiatrist and all that stuff I don't know, it just changed it for me. The lyrics weren't as clever anymore, and the riffs weren't as catchy and hooky as they were when James had control. I just think James needs to dig down and take control and write the killer, clever lyrics again. The last time, I don't know where their heads were at, but they were all writing lyrics and it just didn't work for me. I hope they go back to their roots. I've never taken back a record ever that I've bought, but I took back the Metallica record. I was so angered by what it was, just like a big turnoff. I was like, oh no. It was definitely taking a stand for that because I've always been a big Metallica fan and supporter. Ooh, I hear this really sucks. Hmm, director's commentary. I'm sorry. I am really sorry. Ugh, ugh, I don't know what I was thinking. Did you know that I do all of the editing for these videos by myself? Yep, that's right. Me. One person. Including research, script writing, voiceovers, thumbnails, video editing, promotion. It's a lot of work and requires a full-time job for one person to handle which I don't mind doing because I love being able to express my humor while also talking about the music that I enjoy. However, it would also be great to have some help improving my content, and that's where I need your help. The easiest way to support this channel is to click the like button. This will help the video get shown to more people. A better way to support this channel is to subscribe and hit the notification bell. This will help you get notified when we release new videos each week. And if you really want to make a big difference, Check the description of this video for more ways that you can help this channel grow and support the creation of new content. If you like what we're doing, show us some love and let us know that you're out there. And let us know in the comments what your favorite album is. Perhaps we'll talk about it in a future video. Thank you all so much for your continued love and support. Number 10. Frankenfield This is the face that stones you cold. This is the moment that needs to breathe. These are the claws that scratch these wounds. This is the pain that never leaves. The lyrics to Metallica's Some Kind of Monster appear to describe exactly that, a monster of some kind. Is it a Frankenstein-like beast assembled from the parts of others? Is it something hiding underneath your bed? Is it a song that describes Metallica? All these answers may be correct, as James Hetfield once described the lyrics of the song to producer Bob Rock as describing a horrific creature of some sort or some kind of monster. Some people have come to the belief that the song is indeed about Metallica, a monstrous beast that has grown so out of control that nobody can tame it. A belief that is further reinforced by the band naming their 2004 documentary after the song. James Hetfield has even described the burden of fame that comes from being involved with Metallica as monstrous. Some Kind of Monster was one of the first songs assembled for St. Anger and would go through a handful of changes before the final song was completed. Although it was one of the first songs completed, it would be released as the final single for the album on July 13, 2004. The song would be nominated for Best Hard Rock Performance at the 2005 Grammy Awards. However, Scott Weiland, Slash, Duff McKagan, and the other two members of Velvet Revolver would walk away with that particular award for their song, Slither. While Some Kind of Monster is much about James Hetfield coming to terms with his anger, when asked by an interviewer if part of writing music for a band like Metallica requires holding on to a certain level of anger, James had this to say. Ha ha ha. Well, that's a great question. I think every person that goes through something like what I've gone through very much worries about that. But the creativity, it will come from where it has to come from. Anything can be digested and be spit out Metallica-like. I'm not going to start writing about picking flowers now. When I'm happy, I'm writing the heaviest riff possible. Being happy is not overrated. But also, there will always be anger issues with me, no matter what. There always seems to be another cool piece of the puzzle revealed. Smash 